recording. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I beat you to it. Oh, boy. Hi, Hello. Sally. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm great. What oh, was boy. the best thing that happened to you since the last time we recorded? Oh, my gosh. Uh, or in general. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> whatever's easier and not overwhelming to answer it's not overwhelming i have two things because Great. they're totally one was the thing that happened the other night that i told you was gonna be my best thing mm-hmm. um the other night i was editing a piece of writing and i just found myself like far more deeply engaged with the process than i've ever been before and i was really thinking about like how is the rhythm of these words going to play into how the reader receives it? And like, is this word too direct? Should I find a gentler word? And, and then all of a sudden I had this moment where I was like, oh my God, I'm thinking like a real writer. And then I was like, oh my God, <laughs> what if I could actually be a writer? <laughs> and it was so funny because I've always had people tell me that I should be a writer and writing has always come really easily to me. And you've never... had a blog. You have been a writer. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But it never, you know, it never felt the way people talk about it feeling. Okay. <laughs> I never felt like, oh, wow, I'm actually embodying this, even when I was doing it. So anyway, I just had this moment where I was like, oh, my God, maybe I'll be a writer when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> so that was really fun. Uh, the other thing was that last night, my mom randomly sent me a picture of her holding three <laughs> puppies. Oh, my God. <laughs> She's been talking about getting a puppy, and her friend of hers just happened to rescue four puppies yesterday and one of them was already spoken for but my mom was sitting there holding the other three kind of like trying to decide how many puppies she's gonna go home with (laughs) but she went home with none she went home with none because she really can't decide because she's like well I don't want to take just one because then he'll be lonely Mm -hmm. and I don't want to take just two because then the one I leave behind will be lonely and I was like I can so see you with three little dogs oh my god (laughs) But anyway, I was freaking out, and she was texting me all these photos, and I was just, like, alone in my room making all of these ridiculous noises. Every time a picture would come through, I was like, oh, like, (laughs) they're so cute. They're so cute. They are so cute. So anyway, oh, I just got really excited again. (laughs) Puppies. It's the way to my heart for sure. (sighs) Okay, Sally, what about you? What's the best thing that's happened to you? I had a really great night last night. Uh, I, like, went to the grocery store before Justin came home. You texted me about this, and I was in the middle of a total crisis, so I, like, Uh, didn't even really read your text. So I'm excited to hear about it now. Let me tell you. (laughs) I So normally, Justin and I go to the grocery store together, but I always find that that, like, takes too long. Plus, I wanted wine, and, like, I didn't need for him to just, like, stand there while I'm getting wine because he doesn't drink, so... Whatever. I went to the grocery store, um, but he got he got to the train station like before I was done. So like he joined me at the grocery store, which was nice. And I was and I was almost done. So then we got to walk home together and like catch up on life. And then we prepped. We did all of the like prep work for a slow cooker meal that's good. We're going to turn on today while I was having wine. I haven't had wine in a while. This was why it was so exciting. <laughs> um, and then I had leftover Chinese food, Ugh, which was, it was so tasty and just like listened to my audiobook. Oh, and I, we were listening to baseball while we were cooking because I had already been listening to it. So when he came into the kitchen, like he had no choice. So that was great. Sorry that the Cubs lost. This is going to come out so far from when we're recording it. I, somebody will have won the World Series by then, but Right now, we don't know. It was only game one. <laughs> right now, it's still up in the air. Yeah, and it was very stressful for me to listen, even though I'm not a Cubs fan. So the entire time, I was like, oh, my God, thank God I'm not a Cubs fan, because I would be throwing up. I would be so upset. I would not know what to do with myself. You know what I heard one time that I really loved? What? Uh, I was listening to maybe, like, I don't know, some podcast, and they were talking to one of the justices of the Supreme Court. It might mm-hmm. have been... Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Sex and Money? Oh, no. Never mind. Go on. No, no. It's about baseball. Oh, uh, oh. I don't know why, but they had asked, whoever hosts the podcast had asked this Supreme Court justice what was the best way to learn baseball. I don't know why. 
I don't remember the full context <laughs> of this story, but it was a woman who answered, which I also appreciated. Uh, and she said, I think it was Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Anyway, she said, the best way to learn the game of baseball is to watch it on TV, but with it on mute while you're listening to the radio. Interesting. And I thought that was so cool because on the radio they have to explain everything that's happening. And I was like, well, that's what I should do because every time we go to a baseball game, I'm just constantly asking Matt because I he'll tell me the rules and I'll really understand them. And then we won't see a baseball game for another year. And by then I'll have forgotten all of the rules. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that must have been Sonia Sotomayor. Yes, yes, yes. Which means that it might have been Seth Sex and Money. Cause she was I don't on know. Episode of that. <laughs> well, we'll try to anyway. find it. Put it in the show notes if you want to hear that. Although I did basically just sum up the entire thing, so you don't really need to listen. <laughs> However, let's move on. <laughs> let's start this podcast episode. Okay. Great. <laughs> Our guest today is a friend of mine. I'm the most excited to have her on, especially because we hadn't talked in a really long time. So we spent the time we were supposed to be prepping just catching also, up on life. <laughs> before she comes on, I just have to say, like, I have had such a girl crush on her from afar for like years. Ugh, well, this is perfect. Like, the prettiest and the smartest. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Those are both she's very here. true things. <laughs> she's here. That was great. Hi, Jill. Welcome, Jill. Hi, Jill. Hi. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I like that I was like, I'm going to say this before she comes on, like you can't hear us. <laughs> <laughs> this is great. Oh, gosh. All right. Let's dive in, y'all. I'm excited. Okay. Whew. All right. Now I'm, now I'm like too, now I'm like overwhelmed. Okay. I need to like breathe. Okay. Jill. Hi. Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Um, before we even dive into our conversation, I would love for you to close your eyes and They're just closed. breathe for a moment. <laughs> I like that you told me. And uh, just go back to a year ago today or thereabouts and think about what was happening, how you were feeling, and tell us in one word how you were feeling. Scared. Ooh good word <laughs> oh so we're here because a year ago today jill moved to nairobi that is in africa in case you don't <laughs> it is, know it is in the nation of kenya <laughs> um so yeah i'm oh god okay i have so Why? many questions <laughs> sure we'll start there <laughs> why well so uh, I'm always, a, that's like the hardest question for me because I'm always a little bit embarrassed of the answer because the real answer is I moved here because my boyfriend was moving here. Um, and uh, so I, there was sort of right before I moved to Nairobi, I was at this uh, party in New York. It was a Ring Carmones book party. And I was talking to this woman named Glennis McNichol, who's a writer. And she asked me that question, you know, why, <laughs> why Nairobi? Um, <laughs> And I sort of stuttered through the same answer that I've, you know, that I was giving everyone else, which is that, you know, I wanted to, and which all, all of which is true, which is that I wanted to do more international reporting. I was sort of interested in branching out from sort of just covering feminism and politics in the U.S. to writing about kind of women more broadly. Um, I had spent some time in East Africa. I had really liked it. And also my boyfriend is moving there. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, she, in this really kind of kind way, she interrupted me and, you know, and she said, so you're moving to Kenya because you can. Mm, and mm, Smart lady. And that to me was sort of mm -hmm. such a striking moment. Like, yeah, I, that is why I'm doing this because it sounds like an adventure um, because this is something I've sort of always wanted to do, go live somewhere else, report from somewhere else. But, you know, the, the time never felt right. Um and, you know, I was, am lucky enough to be in a position where I could. Um, I didn't have really any obligations. Um, and so, yeah, so it sounded fun and interesting. And I sort of figured if I move there and if I hate it and my relationship falls apart and everything's terrible, um, I can always move back. You know, it's, I'm, I'm a flight away. All I have to do is pack a suitcase and my cat. Um, so, yeah, so I guess that's, that's, that's the why combination of, love and my job and just kind of wanting to. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. I have so many questions already. I feel like <laughs> I've been to Nairobi and 
Oh man, how do you find? Are you still living there? Yes, I feel <laughs> yes. like I know the answer to that. Yes, you're still living there. How how is it? I really like it. Um, I think Nairobi can be a tough place, especially if you're kind of just coming through and visiting, which is, I think, how a lot of people, you know, not from here experience it as kind of, you know, you're coming through the airport and route to somewhere else, so you're going on safari. Um, you know, it can, I think, come across initially as sort of a tough, somewhat gritty, extremely disorganized place. Um, yes, that's definitely what I felt when I was there. I was yeah, like, what you know. is happening? <laughs> I, do, I don't think it's a place that many people kind of immediately fall in love with. Um, you know, that said, having now been here for a year, I mean, I, I'm sort of surprised by kind of how much of this city, you know, I sort of still discover every day in these kind of little amazing pockets. Um, you know, it's, there are, you know, places in the city that are absolutely stunning that, you know, there's huge green spaces, forests that you can go hike through with like monkeys hanging out. Um, <laughs> there's great food, there's amazing nightlife. And, you know, it's, it's a tough city in a lot of ways. There's, you know, huge disparities in income and very kind of v- constantly visually present inequality. Um, mm. And that can be tough. And I think there are some people who certainly kind of sequester themselves away from that. Um, you know, but at the same time, it is a city that is so culturally rich. It's surprisingly much more diverse than I had assumed it would be. I had assumed, you know, Nairobi is going to be mostly Kenyans. <laughs> mm-hmm. And it, of course, and of course it is mostly Kenyans, but you also have this huge UN presence, which means you, an NGO presence. So you get people from all over the world. Um, you have a longstanding Indian community that, you know, parents and grandparents all were born and raised in Nairobi. Um, Mm. So it's a really kind of dynamic and fascinating place when you scratch the surface a little bit. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Why was your boyfriend moving there? Also, how long had you been with him? Not that long. (laughs) (laughs) So many questions. (laughs) It's a bit of a leap of faith. Um, So I actually met him in Malawi a couple years before we started dating. Uh, He's also a journalist, and we were kind of on the same reporting junket together. Um, So met him in Malawi. We, we, you know, we're we're both in other relationships. We sort of stayed in touch as friends um, and then reconnected a couple years later, you know, back when sort of when our relationships um, had ended. And it was a very kind of quick thing. Um, We reconnected and sort of spent a couple months He was living in Northern Ireland at the time. So I spent a couple of months kind of going back and forth and meeting up in, you know, in Belfast and in New York and in Beirut. Um, And he was moving to Kenya kind of that fall. Uh, This was in the spring. And, you know, very quickly, I think both of us sort of determined this could be the relationship that we want to be in, you know, for for as long as we can kind of foresee into the future. and so, you know, within a couple months, we sort of decided love we'll move to Nairobi together. Um, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like if we were all sitting in a circle, you would be talking and I would be like sitting cross-legged with my like chin in my hand, just like st- <laughs> wide-eyed and staring at you. This is like a whirlwind romance. It is. You know, it, it's a funny thing. I don't know if you guys have read Rebecca Traster's book, All the Single Ladies. Oh, not yet, but I really want to. Um, It's excellent. So, you know, one of the points that she makes in there that really resonated with me is she talks about how, you know, delaying marriage, how this is to the degree that women now delay marriage, which is, you know, often into their early 30s, if not kind of indefinitely, you know, it means that you have all of these years where you're forging relationships, not just, you know, with not just romantic relationships, but also friendships and you're beginning them and you're ending them and you're figuring out kind of what you want from other people and what you're able to give other people. Um, And because there isn't, you know, the same kind of, you know, at 25, you're an old maid deadline as there maybe was, you know, for like my mother's generation. um, By the time you meet someone who you're serious enough about to consider, you know, kind of a lifelong or at least very long-term relationship with them, you have so much of a better and more sort of clearly defined idea of what you want. And I think also a kind of more well-developed skill set of what you're able to bring. Um, Mm. And that's what this felt like to me. You know, I think if I had been 24 or 25 or even, you know, 27, 
and this connection had happened, I don't, I'm not sure that I would have felt kind of as safe as I did taking this leap. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, but I was 32 or 31, 32, um, I was in my early thirties and I think felt like by that point I had a really good idea of (laughs) what was Mm going to work and what wasn't. And who knows, maybe I'll be proven wrong, you know, talk to me in, in 20 years. Um, but I think because of that, it, it felt sort of significantly less risky, um, than it might otherwise have felt. Well, I think it also gives you a really like grounded power and confidence. Like you said, you could just fly back to New York. And I think like for some people, maybe if they're younger um, or they're not used to being that comfortable with their choices and that confident with just like, well, I can just up and change this at mm-hmm. any given point, then they wouldn't. They'd be like, oh, my God, they're panicking. They're like, oh, that seems like such a big thing. Whereas if you're just like, well, no, I could just come back. <laughs> like, I literally that, a flight away. I don't know that that has to do with age, though, because I think that there are so many people who are trapped inside the understanding that, like, once I make a choice, I've made it. Not mm-hmm. like, once I've made a choice, <laughs> if I don't like it, I have the ability to choose differently because that's like... I don't know. I guess I'm starting to see more and more how many people live the first way instead of the second way. Yeah, that's You know, like my mom was like, I guess if I get three puppies and then I find out it's overwhelming, I can like give one of them away. (laughs) (laughs) It was like, that's a very, that's a very wise thing to understand. Way to go, mom. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly true that, you know, the ability to even kind of go back on a choice or make a new choice, you know, there's always kind of some degree of privilege involved in that, right? So, Mm -hmm. you know, when I say, oh, I can buy a plane ticket back to Nairobi or back to New York, you know, (laughs) not everyone has enough money in the bank account to buy a plane ticket. This is why I'm so glad we're talking to Jill because Jill is brilliant. (laughs) She, like, (laughs) sticks it to (laughs) you. Um, yes, it is very privileged, and I'm really glad that you said that because I think that that is something that I probably often overlook. Choice is a privilege. It is. And, I, you know, I think it's – yeah. I mean, when I was moving here, you know, I had a conversation with my mom where she, you know, basically said, you know, I love you and I trust you and I want you to be happy, but, you know, remember that you're never stuck. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you end up – if this ends up being a bad choice for you, like all you have to do is say the word and, you know, we'll – we'll work on getting you back here. Um, And that's very freeing, you know, and certainly not something that everyone has access to. Have you had any moments where you wanted to go home where you were like, I cannot do this thing here? I haven't. I've had moments where I have very intensely missed New York, Um, Mm. you know, and where I have wanted to be back for that week or, you know, a certain moment. Um, Mm. And there have certainly been moments here where I have thought, oh my God, this is so frustrating. (laughs) Um, You know, if this kind of particular inefficient thing keeps happening, like I'm going to go totally (laughs) bananas. Um, That, you know, happens with some regularity. Um, But no, there has not actually been a moment where I thought maybe I've made a mistake. Mm. I, I think that's so great. I'm like so excited about that. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. <laughs> it would be less good if it was the other direction, right? Yes, totally. <laughs> if she was like, I think that every day. Right, every day I wake up wondering what I've done. <laughs> or like, Tyla, actually, I'm going to move back tomorrow. <laughs> I've decided. Um, okay, so now. Is that a rooster crowing in the background? Oh, yeah, probably. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> One time in Africa, I was on a bus, and it was like an overnight bus, and it was dark, but, like, we had been on it overnight, and the sun was coming up, and all of a sudden, a rooster crowed, and I was like, that rooster is on this bus. <laughs> <laughs> that rooster is not outside. That is a rooster that's riding the bus with us. Yeah, I mean, definitely not unheard of. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. It was. A, I'll never forget that moment. <laughs> Oh, gosh, this is great. I forgot my question, but that's okay. Um, Tell us more. What is life like? You've been traveling also, so it's not like you've been there the entire time. Yeah, no, so both of us, my partner and I both travel a lot for work, um, which is a lot of fun, but I think also can contribute to feeling a little bit unmoored all the time. Um, Mm. You know, but, so, I mean, I, 
it's good. Life is so much kind of quieter <laughs> than, it, mm-hmm. than it was in New York. Um, it's funny. So I go back to New York, you know, probably two times a year and I stay for about a month each time. Um, mm-hmm. And every time I go back, it's so funny to look at like my Google calendar versus oh, God, <laughs> how it yeah. is here. Because here it's like <laughs> I'll have like one thing on it. You know, it'll be like yoga, 7 p.m., um, you know, podcast with Sally, 5 p.m. Or like maybe, you know, an interview or a deadline. And in New York, my calendar is always has like nine things on it. So it'll be, you know, coffee with someone and breakfast with someone else and then drinks and then dinner and then post-dinner drinks. And it's just like it's so incredibly scheduled um, Mm -hmm. and frankly overscheduled. And I always feel like I need a vacation like after being back in New York. Um, I feel you. And I love it. It's, you know, it's incredibly energizing and I love seeing people and kind of reestablishing those connections uh, but then I come back to Nairobi and I'm like, okay, all I have to do is like go to the grocery store today. That's, <laughs> that is my task. Um, that's the big item. Yeah. So, I mean, so that's very different. Um, I think one thing that I've been surprised by here is sort of how, how kind of accessible certain things are that I would not have expected to be. So, You know, for example, if I go to the supermarket, there's like almond milk and gluten-free pasta. Mm, And maybe that's like a very silly observation, but (laughs) that was, you know, not necessarily what I was expecting. Um, You know, and so, and in some ways, those little things, you know, kind of as bougie as they are, they also kind of give a source of comfort. Like, okay, Mm. I can still, you know have my coffee with my almond milk in the morning Mm -hmm. um even though I'm in you know a place where so many other things are so different there are still these sort of little pieces that are I don't know kind of like accessible very kind of American or you know things to kind of latch onto. um and I do think when you're kind of in a really big transition and everything feels very different finding some of those little pleasures um, to yeah. anchor you, at least for me, has been has been really important. And I feel a little bit silly saying it, but um, no, definitely you know, that's don't nice. feel silly. Yeah, yeah that hasn't come up before on our podcast, actually. So <laughs> you're in good company. <laughs> I think that's so important. Sally was actually just texting me about that like a day ago, and it was like, what? A, I don't know what you said exactly, but it was like about creating a home wherever you go, and it's yeah. like. I mean, maybe for some people, a home has a whole lot of requirements, but I think also it's when you are in a strange place and you do want to create a home, it's an opportunity to like get down to the things that actually really do make you feel at home Mm -hmm. and the little luxuries that really matter. Totally. Yeah. So I I also brought my cat in order to make it feel like home. (laughs) I imported him from New York. Did you have to like jump through a lot of hoops for that? Or is it like not like going to Europe? They're like, come on, bring in your cat. We don't care. Oh my God. I think it's probably so much worse. Yeah. It it was, it was a process. It was extremely time consuming and expensive. And you know, I don't think the cat was super happy being like shipped as cargo, but (laughs) he's happy now. There are lots of cool bugs to chase. (laughs) <laughs> oh my goodness what's been your favorite moment so far of being here yeah oh gosh um that's a really good question I think one of my favorite sort of times has been when my best friend from the U.S. this woman Julie came and visited um and kind of you know just getting to like show her this place that for her was mm. so unfamiliar for me, it's still a bit unfamiliar, but, you know, it was kind of increasingly my normal. Um, it was really fun. And we, you know, had this moment where we were in a taxi coming back from the airport and, you know, I was telling the driver which route to take, you know, which route to take and, you know, saying, oh, you, you know, take this road and, you know, turn on to James Kachuru and then turn on to Raptor Road, you know, sort of giving him all these directions. And Julie's kind of looking at me and just, you know, laughing. And she's <laughs> like, it's so weird <laughs> hear you <laughs> directing someone of like how to drive around Nairobi um and she was like obviously you live here like you should be able to do that but she was like it's, it's very strange um and yeah and I you know that was sort of a moment where I realized like that is very strange and I do live here <laughs> and it finally kind of feels like it 
<laughs> that is so awesome. That reminds me that Tyler and I still haven't been to Paris together. We've uh, both been I know. there several times, but not together. <laughs> That's my favorite place to be like, look how well I know this place. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> well, I have a question that is maybe less fun, but is very present for me. And I want to know if there have ever been any times where you felt unsafe. Um, yes. You know, not, not too severely, but I, I just sort of curtail my movement here more than I do in New York. Um, you know, I don't walk alone at night here, mm-hmm. um, which sucks <laughs> because, yeah. you know, we're on the equator, so the sun goes down at 630. Um, <laughs> so, you know, night is, is a long time. Um, yeah, you know, Nairobi, uh, crime, obviously, it, it's, it's higher than it is in New York. Um, you know, it's not like – terrible crimes you're you know but you'll you know get robbed or carjacked like that stuff happens um it seems or it seems like it's getting safer and like crime is getting lower but it certainly still exists and so because i don't know the city as well and because crime is just higher i certainly take more precautions here um than i do when i'm in new york and you know that can feel a little bit restrictive Um, you know, there's also, everything here is kind of, is like in a compound, right? So I live in an apartment building, but we have a gate and guards. And even if you drive to a restaurant or to the grocery store, you know, you stop at a gate and guards like look in your car (laughs) and have to let you in. Mm. Um, so there is kind of this constant sense, you know, that something is maybe unsafe and you sort of should always be vigilant. Um, you know, I'm not sure how sort of true that actually is. I'm sure there, you know, nine out of 10 times I would walk down the street at night and be totally fine. Um, Mm -hmm. but that sort of lack of familiarity and also realizing that, you know, as a white person in Kenya, like you stand out as somebody who's probably, you know, probably not super familiar, um, Mm -hmm. I think does contribute to kind of a heightened sense of vulnerability, whether that's fair or not. Oh, Tyler, I feel like you might have a follow-up thing, but that might be wrong. That's what my gut says. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I was just really thinking about that element of being so clearly other, um, you mm-hmm. know, and it's like, the, I feel like kind of the energy behind what you're saying is like, yeah, that's kind of in some ways an imagined construct, and I don't know, I don't know if I actually am unsafe at the same time it's there. Like it's present in your experience and it sounds like it's present in your experience all the time, Mm -hmm. which is just an interesting thing to live with. (laughs) No, I mean, I, you know, I certainly, when I'm, you know, it's during the day and I am walking to the grocery store or to get coffee. Um, you know, I'm certainly more afraid of like getting hit by a car (laughs) than than I am of anything else. Um, which I think is a legitimate fear because driving here is kind of crazy. Um, you know, it's more, I don't know, I think it's sort of this, excuse me as I choke, uh, (laughs) sort of a combination of messages that, that you get, um, you know, one of which is very real kind of crime stats, um, which I think is a legitimate thing to be concerned about, you know, and then another is this kind of pervasive vulnerability that you're raised with when you're raised female, um, and the sense that just by sort of existing in a female body, you're vulnerable, especially to sexual Mm -hmm. assault, Um, but to, you know, kind of any kind of targeting. Um, You know, and then also being in an unfamiliar place, um, you know, and a culture that is not your own, and, you know, being part of a racial group that, you know, is sort of simultaneously extremely privileged, um, but also, you know, a numerical minority, Mm -hmm. so you stand out. Um, and trying to kind of figure out like how to navigate all of that, um, you know, and when to kind of be legitimately at least, I mean, responsible is the wrong word, but, you know, to make certain choices, um, to, to, you know, to curtail or decrease your risk as much as possible, but trying to figure out kind of what those choices are and how to decrease your risk in a way that is actually like sound and not just based on, fear and stereotypes, Mm -hmm. um, can be 
it has been for me a real challenge. Yeah, it sounds like such an incredibly nuanced thing. You yeah. know, it's it's like you could live there and choose to just live in terror all the time. And I'm sure that there are um, Americans who do that, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think it's, you know, there are even people who are sort of hesitant, I think, to come visit because they are afraid, um, I think, often of, you know, literal terrorism, which Kenya has had some issues with, um, you know, but just also of kind of what they perceive as, you know, a high crime, dangerous city. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but living here, that certainly isn't how I've experienced it. I've had zero issues here. Mm-hmm. Um, I have not been, <laughs> I've not been the victim of a crime or even come close to it. Um, you know, I have had uh, overwhelmingly kind of positive experiences. Um, you know, but at the same time, you obviously kind of want to just be a rational and responsible person. But figuring out what that means when you don't, and I don't, understand all the nuances of a place um, I think kind of lends itself to behaving a little more conservatively than I might mm-hmm. otherwise. Okay, I have another question. <laughs> uh, when I was in Kenya, I was in a rural, I was in a rural setting, and we were running an education program that is um, kind of an intercession program for when school's not in session. And there was a moment at which I was asking a girl to like come be one of the students, you know, and I was like, I just love you so much. And I really want you to be a part of this. And she looked at me and here I am like assuming that she and I have pretty similar lives and she can walk around doing whatever she wants. And of course, if she wants to be a part of this, she can. And she looked at me and she said, you know, I I really want to be a part of this, but I I need to ask my husband because I'm not sure who will take care of our three children if I come do this every day for two weeks. And, you know, my, I, I don't, I hope I didn't make a literal face, but like <laughs> in my mind, like my jaw hit the floor and I just had this total moment of being like, oh my God, I know nothing. Because here I was assuming that she is totally free and unencumbered and just like me. And, in a sense, she is just like me, and yet the circumstances of her life are so different. And so that's a very long-winded way of asking you if you've had any of those moments where you're, you know, either literally or inside you, your jaw hit the floor and you had a moment of like, wow, I know nothing. Yeah, I mean, I have those moments all the time. <laughs> um, you know, here and, you know, in a lot of other places that I sort of travel for work. Um, you know, it, uh, so, so much of what I write about, you know, is women, women's rights, um, a lot about kind of access to contraception and abortion and, you know, that kind of like reproductive rights um, universe is the one that I'm, you know, tend to be sort of the most interested in. Um and yeah, you know, sort of talking to women and sort of coming in with my own assumptions, you know, that, I don't know, that you would even kind of want, that obviously kind of you want access to family planning tools, mm-hmm. right? And so you would want the kind of longest form birth control you can get your hands on and the most reliable. Um, and, but sort of hearing like, well, you know, that's great that you want to give me access to an IUD, but, you know, it's really hard for me to get to a hospital, right? Mm-hmm. So this is, like, not something that I'm able to access regularly. And it's really expensive and, you know, and all of that. So, you know, if you put this thing in, there's not necessarily a guarantee that I'm going to be back in five mm-hmm. years for you to take it out and replace it. Um, you know, or, okay, if you put it in IUD. So this, when I, I was, this is not Kenya-specific, but... Um, this was a conversation I had in India a couple months ago with a woman who, you know, was basically saying that kind of one issue with long-term birth control, um, is, you know, that if, uh, if, um, you know, a woman's husband doesn't give permission, then she can't, she just can't get access to it at all. I'll, I'll give you another example, which is actually where Ty, my boyfriend and I met in Malawi when we were on this reporting fellowship um, we were talking to some uh, schoolgirls in kind of a small village in rural Malawi. And some of the girls 
you know, lived at the school in these sort of dorm rooms, and a few of them commuted in, but their teacher and sort of the principal of the school was basically saying that one of the biggest problems is that the commute to school is really long. You know, it's like 12 kilometers each way um, on these kind of rural roads. And so some of the girls walk it, but a lot of them stop coming, especially kind of when they hit adolescence, because when girls are walking alone on rural roads, Mm -hmm. they get raped. And if you get raped, obviously that's, you know, individually traumatic, but then if you get pregnant, it means you can't stay Mm -hmm. in school. Um, And you often sort of end up being paired off with your rapist. So, you know, it creates this huge barrier, not just that it's so far, but that it's so dangerous. Um, And so when you're looking at, like, why are girls not in school, you know, just kind of, like, building a school um, isn't going to be much of a solution. And, you know, on that trip, there are two other women, this woman, Lauren Bond, um, and another woman, Zoe Fox, who are both journalists, who ended up starting kind of a very small initiative called School Cycle, which used Soul Cycle classes in New York to raise money to buy bikes for mm. girls so then they could bike to the school. Um, and, you know, when you put a girl on a bike, like, A, it gets her there faster, and B, it just means she's, you know, far less vulnerable to being physically yeah. attacked. Um, and so for, you know, little kind of, when you're talking about kind of development work and, you know, work to promote human rights and access to things like education and contraception and, you know, all of the, the things that are good things to have access to, um, you know, being kind of very specific to what the problem is, I, at least in my experience, has been pretty valuable. Um, and it can be really hard to accurately assess the problem and see kind of all the impediments that people face as an mm-hmm. outsider. Um, so Tyler, to kind of get back to your question, <laughs> like, That happens to me all the time, where I sort of assume that I understand what a problem is or what an issue is or why, you know, something could function better, you know, if I were in charge of it. Yeah, like, I know how to fix Africa. Just do X, Y, Z. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And then you get there and you're like, Um, oh. (laughs) Yeah, and then you scratch the surface a little bit and, you know, you sort of hear people say, well, you know, here's why I'm not doing the thing that you think would be yeah. better for me to be doing. And it's like, oh, right. Duh. <laughs> You've probably thought of this. Right. <laughs> oh. oh, my gosh. I don't know who I was talking to the other day, but I guess they had a problem to solve and someone had given them a suggestion. And they were like, don't you think that's the first thing I tried? <laughs> it's like, we all think we're so smart. <laughs> It's so humbling to kind of be confronted with that every day, to have that kind of like right in your face, like, oh, wow, this is so much more complicated than I ever could have imagined. It's not like, it's not like any of us being ignorant to the problems that exist on purpose. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no, it it is. And it's also really enlightening to kind of see different sort of local problem solving strategies and, you know, how, I don't, how sort of different cultures and individuals and, you know, even kind of academics and NGOs, how all these different um, actors approach these issues. Um, you know, I, so I was back in Malawi a couple months ago uh, doing some work on HIV self-testing. So they now have these incredible HIV kits where you kind of just swab the inside of your mouth and then you, you know, stick the little stick in a vial. Um, and within like 15 or 20 minutes, it tells you if you're positive or not. So it's pretty incredible, especially for rural communities where people aren't able to get to the hospital. Um, you know, but in a lot of rural communities, people are illiterate, right? And so they, you can't read an instruction yeah. manual. And with these kits, you've got to like do the test right. Yeah. Or you're going to get oh, a false positive or a false negative. And, you know, it was so interesting talking to, you know, it was, it, was some, it was some folks that were kind of academics and then some that were NGO folks, um, and then a lot that were kind of in the local Malawian public health ministry. Um, but it's all people who know how to read. And, you know, so the, sort of the first thing they went to was, okay, we can't, you know, put this into words, but let's put it in like street signs, right? Mm-hmm. So you're not supposed to eat before you take the test. So we'll put a big red X over like a, a picture of a plate of food. Um, you know, and we'll sort of use these, what we understand to be common symbols. 
Well, if you live in rural Malawi and you're illiterate, you probably also don't drive. <laughs> and so you probably like don't know what's, you know, these kind of like arrows and like, you know, the sort of street symbols mean, um, which they didn't realize. So they start testing this kit and, you know, people see an X over something. And if you've never seen that before, you see, okay, it's a plate of food and it's drawing attention to it. Well, maybe I should, am I, I'm supposed to eat? I'm not supposed to eat? Like, you know, which is a totally logical con- conclusion, um, you know, from a symbol you don't understand. But sort of those kind of challenges, right, I, I do find totally fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, and especially kind of as, you know, I don't work in development, but I report a lot on it. And talking to folks who do kind of work in that sector and trying to figure out, okay, you know, how do we meet people where they're at? Um, and how do we kind of engage local communities in helping, you know, in sort of being the leaders in this stuff? Um, it's hard. <laughs> and it's, it's also really interesting to observe. How to meet people where they're at is like the theme of the year. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Oh, God. Well, because first you have to care enough to see where they're at. Yeah. And that's not always an easy thing to do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. I find that mostly people, I mean, I was going to say something and then I changed my mind. Uh, <laughs> say it. <laughs> I just like the, I think that for most people, if they don't have a vested interest in like where you're at then they're not going to want to go there at all anyway and so it just becomes this whole like complicated thing so it's like do I care enough to engage with you in this no okay we'll have a good day goodbye like and so things I think shut down earlier than they maybe would otherwise like if people were just a little bit more compassionate and people by people I mean me too I mean this is not like me saying everyone sucks except for me that's not what that is but I think like we could all use a little bit more compassion and connectedness yeah and I mean the other thing is that okay so moving away from talking about development work and now moving into talking about our emotional lives (laughs) which we like to do on this show it's like you also have to realize when someone else is not willing to meet you where you're at you know Mm -hmm. you can only do so much to be like I'm here to meet you at where you're at, but if you can't do the same for me, then there is no point in this engagement together. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we both have to care enough to come to that place where we understand each other before we can move forward in a way that is helpful and supportive to everyone. Because if not, I'm just handing you street signs that you don't understand. (laughs) And (laughs) that's how I really feel is happening a little bit in my life right now. So... Ah, okay, wait, I have another question, and it's completely kind of changing the topic back more to your emotional life, Jill. Great. What is the most challenging thing that you've faced inside your romantic relationship in this last year? Um, I would say, I mean, by far the most challenging thing has been having my partner be kind of my primary social, emotional, everything yeah. outlet. Um, I've never done that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I've I've been in other serious relationships, but I've always been in them in a place where I had a sort of large and multifaceted community. So, you know, I was living in the same city as most of my very close friends. I, you know, would have drink dates in the evenings with women who maybe were not like my best friends or people who I really liked talking to and spending time with and who I you know, would always sort of come away from those interactions feeling really excited and energized. Um, You know, there were kind of a lot of events to go to. And I had my yoga community, which was really important to me. And, you know, all these kind of like intersecting circles of, frankly, mostly women um, that really kind of set out all the, you know, the the foundation of my whole life as a person. and, you know, my relationships were always kind of bringing someone else in that was kind of a value add mm. to that um, and was kind of one piece of a big kind of life map but wasn't central to it. Um, you know, and here 
I mean, I moved here and I didn't know anyone except Ty, uh, my boyfriend. And, you know, life kind of is quieter here. And there are whole days where I don't talk to anyone, you know, except him and maybe like the person at the coffee Mm. shop. Um, And that for me is really, really new. And it's been really hard uh, to navigate that and to figure out, you know, on the one hand, like, I really like him. <laughs> so I, I like spending time well, with him. that's good, since you did move all our, across the world with him. <laughs> right. And so, you know, we have, and we both do travel so much that, you know, there will be months where, you know, we only see each other for a couple of days. And so when we do have, you know, a lot of time together, I've been surprised at how hard it is to kind of force myself to say, okay, you know what? One night a week, I'm going to go out with like a girl who I've met who I like. Mm. Um, And it's been hard to figure out how do I make friends? (laughs) You know, when they're like not people that are just sort of there and, you know, have been there from college or, you know, grad school or work or, you know, friends of friends or whatever. Um, You know, having to kind of, send an email to a girl you met at a party and say, I like yeah. you. Do you want to do you want to <laughs> I love out? that so much. <laughs> Kyla's really good at Is, that. You should I do that her. all the time. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm so bad at it. Um, and so then also, you know, because Ty is my only outlet, sort of talking this stuff through with him and saying like, I miss having friends. I miss having this really dynamic social life and figuring out a way to say that that doesn't make it sound like <laughs> you're not mm-hmm. enough. <laughs> Or like there's something, you know, or like I, I don't know, that you're not sort of complete, a complete enough relationship for me. Um, That's been a really hard transition. And I feel like I'm still kind of in the middle of figuring it out. Yeah. Just last night, I turned to Justin at one point and was like, Justin, I really would love for us to have more couple friends. And he was like, okay, (laughs) how are we going to make these couple friends? I was like, I haven't figured that out yet, but I'm just putting it out there that I would really (laughs) love that. (laughs) Oh, wait, this is so funny because I am sitting right next to my bookshelf. And just now I was like, okay, I'm going to pull out the book that I'm thinking of and I'm going to just flip through. And if I can find the thing I want, I'm going to share it. And if not, I won't, but I found it. Great. Um, (laughs) There's a book by Kurt Vonnegut a man without a country. And he talks about this. And I just think that he says it so well. Uh, can I share that with you guys? Do it. Please. So he says, all right, let's have some fun. Let's talk about sex. Let's talk about women. Freud said he didn't know what women wanted. I know what women want a whole lot of people to talk to. What do they want to talk about? They want to talk about everything. What do men want? They want a lot of pals and they wish people wouldn't get so mad at them. Why are so many people getting divorced today? It's because most of us don't have extended families anymore. It used to be that when a man and a woman got married, the bride got a lot more people to talk to about everything, and the groom got a lot more pals to tell dumb jokes to. (laughs) And then I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, Now when we get married, it's just all about one person. The groom gets one more pal, but it's a woman. The woman gets one more person to talk to about everything, but it's a man. When Mm. a couple has an argument nowadays... They may think it's about money or power or sex or how to raise the kids or whatever, but what they're really saying to each other without realizing it is this, you are not enough people. Mm. A husband, a wife, and some kids is not a family. It's a terribly vulnerable survival unit. I love that. And yeah, that's, I I just feel like (laughs) we, I think in the society Or in a large section of the society, we have somewhat forgotten the importance of community. And we do place so much in and on our partnership that it's no wonder that so many partnerships crumble. Mm -hmm. It's so much pressure. Yeah. I don't know. There's another book that was just mentioned on Call Your Girlfriend, and maybe it's called The New Better Off. Yeah, but Courtney Martin's. Yeah, Courtney Martin's. Yeah, yeah. And in that, that she evidently talks a lot about rediscovering the importance of community in your life and how if you have this this support network, it just makes everything better for everyone. And so, I don't know. I have a lot of empathy for you, Jill, being there and not having it built in, and so much um, admiration for you for being so aware of it and for trying to seek it out despite the fact that it's extremely challenging. Yeah, and talk to me in a year. Maybe I'll have to figure it out by then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, it has been 
there are a lot of journalists here, which is nice. And there's a lot of folks who, you know, we really like. We're having two of them over for dinner tonight. You know, a couple who um, both of us really kind of enjoy both of their company. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, it's, it's felt nice to kind of start forging some of those relationships. Um, you know, it's just also a very challenging space, given that my life with Ty is sort of more domestic than anything I've ever experienced. Um, you know, and that when, you, when you're in a community of journalists, like everyone travels yeah. all the time and everyone's all over the place. And no one expects to be here forever either, right? So people come for, you know, three or four or five years and then they leave. And so there's a sense of kind of being transient through this place um, that also I think makes forging really the kind of deep tie um, really intimate relationships that I feel like I'm currently craving quite badly um, makes those really tough and creates a whole set of incentives against even mm -hmm. having them. Yeah, because there's this sense of like, even if I invest the time and energy, this thing is not going to last because we're not both going to be here. But right. you really could say that about every relationship because we all die. Yeah, that's totally. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> well, I think that's what I was talking about when I was texting you the other day, Tyla, about like my commitment to making home wherever I am um, is really something that I learned in Paris when I went whenever that a few the few years ago, like the two times ago, <laughs> not this most recent time. Um because I had no idea how long I was staying there, but I was so committed to making it feel like home that any person that I met, I was like, let's be friends. <laughs> let's, let's hang out again, come to pub quiz. And then if we like each other some more, let's go get coffee. And it was uh -huh. really, we developed really intense and deep and meaningful bonds, um, which like we don't talk some of those people I have, I haven't spoken to in years. Um, but like, you know, even like the people that I'm closest to, we might email twice a year, like on birthdays and like, Hey, how are you? What's new? Oh, you know, Adam moved in with his girlfriend. Oh, did he? <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Um, but yeah, I think that like, if you commit to living where you are as if you were going to stay there forever, then even if you stay there for a few months, it ends up meeting a lot more. Mm -hmm. to you that's I been really my experience agree. I've been wondering lately why I've lived in the same apartment for five years and I'm still not friends with the people that work at the grocery store down the block <laughs> like what, what's wrong with me <laughs> that's funny you should make friends with them I know I've been talking to the baristas a lot more that's good that's yeah. a start <laughs> you should also make friends with the people who work at um, Havana Outpost Mm. Even though they're only there for half a year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that just seems like a nice, convenient friendship to have. <laughs> okay, I'll work on that. <laughs> <laughs> That's my personal request. You request guests to Instagram things. I'll request that you make friends with the people I have been out post. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, what else? What else do we have, ladies? Jill, what else is present for you? Oh, gosh. Um... I was just telling Sally this is like a very hectic time. Yeah, Jill's got a lot going on. <laughs> I, uh, my parents are sort of, I'm in between back-to-back -back parental visits. Um, and my, I have been, spent the past two years writing a book. And the final, 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 can't really change anything after this draft um, is due on in like two weeks. Ah! Um, and is due a week after the elections. So an election season mm -hmm. obviously, for, as a political writer is also kind of nuts. So um, <laughs> of like parents and, you know, going on safari, which is super fun, but also having to write about Donald Trump, which is super depressing. Ugh. And then having to like write a book, which is totally terrifying and, you know, feels like it's just nowhere near good enough, um, has kind of made me like not sleep oh, for the past my month. Oh gosh, Jill. Your book is good enough. I haven't read it, but I know that it is. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're awesome. I'm so excited about this book, by the way. Tell us, can you tell us a little bit about what it is? Yeah, so um, it is called The H Spot, The Feminist Pursuit of Happiness. Ah, I love um, it already. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, sort of the, the general thesis um, is that in the U.S., 
in sort of the formation of the project that you know is the United States. Um, happiness was a sort of very explicit uh, political goal, and not just kind of like a personal consumer you know desire. Um, but it was a political goal that was laid out for a certain class of people, which was you know at the time landowning white men. Um, and sort of from there, so many of our laws and policies have been built around promoting the comfort and happiness of that same group. Um, and, you know, the sort of desires and life patterns and, you know, uh, experiences um, of women and people of color, people of color, although the book is focusing primarily on sort of women as a large category, um, have been traditionally left out. And so I was curious, what makes women happy? What do we know from this sort of increasingly large body of social science research on happiness? Um, and then what would it look like if women got to create kind of a happiness politic um, and a national policy of, of happiness? Um, yeah, so traveled around the country, spent time with a lot of different women, interviewed a lot of different women, read a bunch of <laughs> to way too many um, <laughs> studies and, you know, uh, sort of dove into that whole universe of social science around happiness um, and how it kind of plays out according to gender um, and kind of what other identity components influence what makes people happy and who's happy and how and why and when um, to sort of paint what I hope is a pretty broad picture um, of our current kind of lack of female happiness and then a policy landscape that could improve it. I, love I got chills over my whole body like three so. different times <laughs> while you were talking. But I mean... That's a very long-winded uh, explanation. I need to work on my elevator no, pitch. No, it's so but... good. I mean, it's, it's a, such a complex thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, uh, yeah, so it is. And it's actually been funny. I've been writing so much of it, you know, about American women, um, but from here. And also writing about the U.S. election mm-hmm. from here. Um, sort of in tandem. And that's been, I think, kind of in, in many ways uh, tough, but I think in many others really enlightening to kind of have a little bit of kind of physical and psychological distance to cover this stuff. I want to know what it's like to be kind of like intensely studying happiness, like in a very intellectual way. And also being in such a new situation in your life and striving to be happy inside actually so many new situations that you haven't been in before from like this domestic partnership with your boyfriend to living in a totally foreign place. Like how have those two things facilitated one another, your intellectual journey and your own emotional journey? Yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I mean, I think in, sort of a really basic way, a lot of the research and literature on happiness has made me kind of more conscious of small ways I can adjust my own life to, <laughs> to um, facilitate being happy. So, you know, what we were just talking about, about community and friendships, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of one of the most important things, and this is probably fairly obvious, but, you know, one of the most important sort of components for um, lifelong satisfaction is having those kind of connections, um, feeling connected with not only a partner, but, you know, your family and your community and social institutions, um, having tr- high levels of trust in social institutions, you know, believing that your church will show up for you or the police will help you or your government's not corrupt. Mm. Um, those things matter quite a bit in terms of how happy people are. Um, you know, and in being in a place like Kenya where, that isn't necessarily true where, Mm. you know, you have a lot of problems with kind of corruption and sort of seeing the day-to-day instability that that breeds, I think has been very, very interesting and enlightening. Um, And it's made it extra scary, frankly, to hear somebody like Donald Trump spread this falsity that, you know, the elections in the U.S. are rigged and that this is all set up, you know, trying to sow this kind of distrust in our public institutions. Um, I think can have these kind of enormous and terrible ripple effects, both for stability, but also kind of for how satisfied individuals are with their lives. Um, So that's been really interesting. It's also kind of challenged my definition of like, what does happiness mean, right? Is it 
I sort of went into this project thinking, okay, happiness is like feeling happy. <laughs> like it's about feeling good. Duh. Um, which is actually kind of how researchers tend to measure it. You know, they sort of, they ask people um, about their well-being and, you know, how happy do they kind of generally feel, you know, either today or about their lives as a whole. Um, but I think one thing that's been interesting about being here and about this project, you know, is thinking about, Happiness, not just in terms of how do I feel, um, does this feel good, but also in terms of am I learning and evolving and, you know, do I kind of feel like I have the ability to pursue knowledge and, you know, am I taking advantage of that? Mm -hmm. Um, And that kind of, I think, bigger picture philosophy of like what makes for a happy life, a life of intellectual pursuits, a life of adventure, a life of dynamic and varied experiences, um, even if those things can sort of sometimes feel unpleasant in the moment, um, that they contribute to this sort of bigger picture of experience and satisfaction. Um, I think for me, it's kind of reframed a lot of my experiences here as like, yes, maybe this is a bit challenging right now, but like stop and look around and, you know, take a breath and look, you're like living in an amazingly beautiful place, um, in a place that, you know, is culturally fascinating and dynamic and, you know, rapidly changing. Um, and so few people have the opportunity to, to do that, to step so far outside of what they're used to and, you know, what an amazing gift for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so thinking about it in those terms, I think has really sort of both shaped the book and how I'm talking about happiness and then also kind of how I evaluate my own life here. I love all of this. I'm <laughs> yeah, I'm glad I asked that question. <laughs> it was a good answer. <laughs> oh, man. Ugh. Sally, I'm do you have anything else? Or should we wrap up? I guess we can wrap up. I just like want to talk to Jill forever. I know. I well, know. When are you two coming to Kenya? We can I do was a live literally version. just thinking, like, I need to get to Kenya. <laughs> yeah, I would. I would love to come too. Well, I, we have a guest room. You have a free place to stay. Oh, my gosh. gosh. Dude, look at that. <laughs> Are you planning to be there for the foreseeable future? Yeah. I mean, I think both of us are really flexible, and we both really love it here. So, we're you know, we're here for at least another year. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's another two years or three years, like, I think that would be fine with us, too. Um, you know, that said, like, we are b- both in an industry – that's changing pretty rapidly. Yeah. And so it can be really hard to predict like where we're both going to be job wise. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm sort of happy to stay here for a while longer, but you know, if something professionally changes, then I think we would, you know, obviously accommodate that. Mm. Um, but I do think what's, what's nice is that both of us, you know, don't feel a need to kind of be tied to any particular place. And you know, would love to have the kind of lives where we're able to do what, you know, we're doing here, um, which is, you know, live in new places, experience new things, and kind of keep that going. You know, that this isn't going to be just a two or three year blip, right? That maybe we'll live in Asia, maybe we'll live in Europe, you know, we'll sort of adventure all around for as long as, as long as we want to. Mm, Follow the call. Yeah, Yeah, right? (laughs) I love that. Ah! As long as the cat can come. (laughs) That's funny. <laughs> I love that. Oh. Jill, so, you, I'm going to start randomly emailing you. This is a side note. I'm going to just start okay. randomly <laughs> sending you like long emails about my life. <laughs> Please. I, I miss our Abilene dates. Yeah, I know. They were really great. And I can get beer when I send them so that it can be really appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry. Tyler, go on. <laughs> well, I was going to say, do you want to ask the wrap up questions? Sure. Or do you want Why me to? not? Okay, great. All right. So Jill, I invite you once again to close your eyes and to think about everything that has transpired in the last year. And from where you are right now, let us know again in one word how you're feeling. Excited. Yeah, that's a big change from scared. Well, maybe not. Yeah, right. You feel (laughs) it in the same place. But you know, they say that... What is it? What's the saying? Uh, scared and excited are the same thing, but scared is excited without the breath. Oh, I've not heard that hmm. before. 
Yeah, I don't know where I heard that, but <laughs> I it's like the same emotion, just the ability to breathe inside of it. Huh. Mm. Well, I like that a lot. Okay. Yeah, God, (laughs) Sally, can I tell you, when you asked me that question at the beginning of the podcast, like the moment that I pictured was, it was actually sort of the end of August because I, that was when I was like moving out of my New York apartment. And it was the day before I was moving all my stuff um, into like a room I was renting, you know, in the kind of in-between months when I was back and forth a lot. And I was, Ty had just left. He had already flown to Kenya. I was alone. All my stuff was in boxes. Mm -hmm. Um... My cat was already at, like, the friend's house who was going to be watching him for a couple weeks. And this is, like, the cheesiest story. But I had my, like, (laughs) iTunes, you know, set to random. And (laughs) I – that stupid Taylor Swift New York song came on. Mm -hmm. And, like, I actually really hate that song. Like, I I find it – it must have been my – I don't even think I have that song. It must have been, like, you you know, some YouTube list. And that song came on, which I can't stand. Um – But it was about New York, and I was, like, leaving New York, and I sat on my floor of this, like, empty, sad apartment surrounded by boxes and just, like, lost it. Yeah. Just, like, sat and cried to Taylor Swift, like, the biggest white girl Uh, on the planet. Um, I feel you. I feel you. I'm with you. (laughs) And I remember thinking, like, God, I'm going to miss this city so much, and, you know, maybe – I don't think I'm making a mistake, but, you know, maybe – Ty is not a mistake, but maybe leaving here is a mistake. Mm. Um, well, and it is seems... a big relief. I skip that song now because it doesn't actually like, – <laughs> it doesn't elicit any emotional response in me anymore. So I think that's a good thing. Oh, this leads perfectly to our last question, which is <laughs> if you could speak to yourself in that moment from the woman that you are today, what would you say to her? Hmm. I would say – you're doing fine. You should be sad. Mm. <laughs> this is a big transition. And, you know, you're, you're sad because you've built a really beautiful life here for yourself. And that is something to be proud of and, you know, to grieve letting go of a bit. Yeah. Um, but also that, like, it's going to turn out fine. And, yeah, that you have more good things coming than you can imagine. Mm. Yay! <laughs> I love it. I know. Oh. oh my gosh, Jill! Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for having me. I actually hate talking about my feelings, so this was kind of cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> you now that you say that, now I do remember that. But I didn't think about that when I asked you to be on. If I had thought about it, I probably wouldn't have asked you. But this was great. I will have my most emotionally <laughs> repressed friend on this podcast. <laughs> I love it. You did a great job. Yeah. Being really very nice. open. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, Jill, where can the people find you on the internet? Um, you can find me on Twitter at, at Jill Filipovich. And if you want to see a lot of, like, photos of giraffes and elephants, um, same thing on Instagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they are great photos. <laughs> I'm obsessed. Oh, okay, Tyler, where can the people find you? I'm at TylaFowler.com and Tyla Fowler on all the social media. Woohoo! You can what about find, yourself? You can find me at Sally Simply on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and at SallyMercedes.com or UnmutedExpression.com. And if you like our intro outro music, you can follow Zena Hell, Z Y N A H E L, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or SoundCloud. And you can follow us, A Year Ago Podcast, on all the things. And you can email us. Please email us before a year Tyla ago podcast at gmail.com. <laughs> <laughs> Please email us and rate and review us, subscribe, blah, blah, blah. Share it with a oh, friend. Oh, we got a new review, didn't we? We did get a new review. I'm very excited Yay! about it. Thanks for the reviews, people. You rock. Uh, is that it? Did I, I fail the so. phone? All right. Thanks, everybody, for Peace listening. Out. We love you. Bye. Bye.